Uh, so basically, uh, today I'm going to talk about what is our expectation of the clinical evaluation. As you know, the evaluation is divided into two, which is one, clinical, and as, uh, the second one, which is the thesis defense. Uh, I think it's very important uh, that you give equal and um, equal importance to the clinical uh, defense, because most of you think that the clinical defense is just basically a pass or a buy. We're going to do away with that. Uh, if you do not submit all the required documents, we're not going to even allow you to sit for the clinical defense. This, this is how it is going to be in the future. I think this is what was mentioned by uh, Prof. Ng. Okay. It's actually stated before, we just been a bit more relaxed about it, but we're going to move on with that. Okay. So what we've been having is actually formative assessment for all of you. Uh, formative assessment, basically your in-training uh, uh, assessment. Uh, what we look at is whether you're learning the right things to the right standard. Uh, and if you have poor assessment uh, continuously, it may warrant consideration of extension within the program. So what we look at are things like uh, your entrustable professional activities, such as what you've been doing, uh, your workplace-based assessment, blog books, case write-ups, as well as your portfolios. I'll explain all these uh, one by one. So what do we mean by workplace-based assessment? Uh, these things actually measures the trainee's ability to apply the skills and the knowledge uh, learned during the attachment. And work or task challenge uh, uh, these trainees to use their high order thinking skill and technical skills to achieve your objectives and complete the process. And assessment should ideally possess the characteristics uh, described all these things below. Okay, what we use is actually reliable, which means the results are reproducible, it's valid. So whatever that we ask you to do uh, and how we assess you, it actually measures what we intend to measure. Uh, it actually drives learning. So it gives a bit of an educational impact and it's actually accept, uh, acceptable, especially to local sensitivity of what we do here. And also it's, it's very feasible. It doesn't cost you guys money to do it. And uh, we look at a few domains when we assess you. We look at cognitive domain, psychomotor domain, and also affective domain. Um, uh, as you can see, I think different units, they do different variations of, of, of these, uh, even if you're not sure, or even if it's not formalized. We have things like case-based discussions, mini clinical evaluation, your direct observed uh, clinical encounters, and also the technical skills such as your DOPS, your procedure-based assessment. Now, I noticed that all these things are really not formalized into what you do right now. It will be in the future, but if you know uh, in your three monthly assessment when you finish your rotation, there are elements of this included. So um, now, this is one of the examples of these forms uh, that you have. Uh, in terms of the, the periodic evaluation that you have. I'm sure all of you are very familiar with this uh, form. And uh, basically, if you look at this form, uh, is when you finish your posting or finish your rotation and your uh, assessor will have to um, uh, mark you according to this. And all these things which you see here under the work based assessment is actually somewhat done. Uh, some of them take a variation of SPA, some doing what rounds, they observe you doing what rounds, some of you observe you doing surgery. So we look at things such as your attitude, your knowledge, your education, your clinical skills, your whether you're responsible and you're professional in your, in your dealings, and uh, basically whether you're satisfied in the posting or not. And then we give recommendation based on that. So you need to pass this, okay? Um, there's no strict rules on how many must fail uh, in order for you to proceed. But if, if you do fail, then we do, we, we do bring it up in a meeting um, before we decide to let you proceed. So the comments and the recommendation on whether you proceed or not is very important. Okay, So essentially, you shouldn't be failing any of them. Um, in terms of the log book, um, basically what we do is that uh, the idea is that it documents your operating experience. Uh, you're supposed to record a level of competence. And please, please have a consolidation sheet. I notice most of you are not consistent with the consolidation sheet. You have all your log cases, but you don't give me a consolidation sheet. A lot of you also come out with all these log book cases that is not updated. I really find that not acceptable. It's not acceptable to any extent. And uh, I think the next time, if let's just say, I will recommend that if let's just say you do not update a log book, you have, do not have all the complete documents separated, you know, uh, and, and you do not bother checking yourself with uh, uh, um, your, uh, uh, Halila or Isa then, or, or Farah or Isa for that matter, then I, I don't think we should be, we should be uh, um, uh, even allow you the, the, you know, the audience to actually have a clinical review because you're not fulfilling your part of the responsibility. 
Okay, so please, please be, be, be obsessed with your logbook and make sure that you get it done. Okay. Uh, I do not find it acceptable that you say that you do not up, you did not update it, you did not include this, you did not include that. I think that is really not acceptable. Of course, your, your logbook should have the minimum cases per number. Uh, it should be regularly reviewed you. uh, by your trainer as well. And uh, if you look at it, this is actually the skill level which you, which these are the descriptors uh, of uh, your logbook. I know a lot of you use variation of logbook. I would really like you guys to keep to this one where the skill level shows uh, what you've done. Uh, and uh, basically, um, all of you should be doing around the skill level of five okay, or six. Um, or, or you can just use the descriptive equivalent. But if you can use the numbers, even better. Yeah, okay. And then when you have the logbooks, please put it in a sense that have that level of skill above. Okay. Um, uh, this is the type of logbook. This is the example of logbook you should have. A lot of you have a lot of variation of logbook. I don't know why. Before you giving you the template, this is the template that's given to you, but I'm, we're still getting very different uh, different logbook formats. Okay, so 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 you know we we, we need we need you guys to actually synchronize and and and, and standardize all of your logbook so that it's understood. And please put this on every page. Uh, the, the, the item uh, of the logbook over here, patient name, age, registration, diagnosis, procedure, perform, level of skill, remarks, complication. Please put it at the top of every page, okay, so that we, we, we know what, what to do for each, uh, what, what is for each one. Otherwise, we have to just keep on flipping back. Again, a very poor example of not being prepared when you submit your logbook. These are the example of your consolidation sheet. Consolidation sheet basically is just an example of how many cases you've done without the names, without the ID. It's just uh, the number of cases, what cases, and what are the numbers at whichever uh, 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 complexities that you have done it at. Okay, uh, you're supposed to have three case write ups in surgery. Um, you should come with complete case write up. You should include literature review. This should be verified and signed by consultants. At the moment, it's encouraged to publish but it's not actually compulsory. Okay, what else is in the CPD portfolio? Your CPD portfolio should be kept with you at all times, just besides by logbook and also case write-ups, you should also have other uh, CPD such as scientific meetings and congress, workshop courses, work-based learning, quality improvement activities, training presentations, research publications, as well as self-directed learning and also professional development. What I mean by this, I'm just basically, what, what you encounter most of is actually courses. Now, there are mandatory courses that you're supposed to do, which is the ATLS, your CRIPS course, NOTS course, and also endoscopy course. And here are the recommended courses which uh, you guys are supposed to do. I think most of you would have joined the consistectomy course. Now, with regards to the mandatory course, uh, we are not being too strict with it because we understand that, that there has been a problem since the COVID and a lot of courses are actually postponed or cancelled. Uh, so we're not too strict with this at the moment, given the fact that those have happened. But um, I believe most of you would have done this course as well um, and have been given the opportunity to do this course. Uh, try to register for it before your next assessment, if possible. Okay, there's another clip that's coming up actually soon. Okay, so during your assessment uh, evaluation, this is the, the, the form that we will fill. So basically, we will see you. We we'll look at what study, year study you are. In this case, you'll be year four, and then uh, we look at your um, evaluation date. The most important thing is we want to see whether you have actually completed your end of posting satisfactorily. Uh, is that a yes or is it a no? Uh, and if it's no, we must put the reason why, and then we need to recommend to Prof Ng and also to the division and later on to the department to see whether we need any remedial measures. Um, when we look at logbook. Scope doesn't mean endoscopy, okay? Scope means we're looking at it's actually the scope, which means we look at the breadth of your procedure. Is it whether it's uh, acceptable or is it not acceptable? And also we look at the breadth of your numbers. Is it acceptable or not acceptable? This is where we find most of the problems, actually, uh, that a lot of you do not fulfill the, 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 the number of procedures. And we find it very odd because uh, the person can be from the same year, come from the same hospital, uh, yet their scope, their, their scope and also their numbers can differ a lot. We can't explain why. Uh, maybe opportunities, but you guys can't blame everything for opportunities. You know, it's a lot about 
you know, because you need you need to drive your stuff. And 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 we have stopped our students from going on with for exams if they did not achieve the appropriate scope of uh, surgery, uh, um, the required surgery, especially when they couldn't give a proper excuse and when we're given ample opportunities. Um, uh, so beware of that. We, I think every assessment we have told you to, there's things they need to remediate and this will actually be documented in the previous forms. If there's any issues, then what we will do is we will actually look at the previous forms and see what we have asked you to remediate at. If you did not perform it, we will not hesitate to, to, to not let you pass your clinical evaluation. So which means you have to wait for another six months or so. The others will be things like uh, other WBAs and also CPD portfolios which we've done, whether you completely a case write-ups, whether you've um, uh, uh, whether those case write-ups were, uh, were, were satisfactory and whether you have completed the courses. If you are not completed courses, there should be the reasons why. The comments will usually mostly be whether uh, we think you should proceed with your uh, uh, with your training or for your exams, or whether we should remediate. Now, this will actually be done by um, three different uh, uh, faculty and also uh, academic staff, uh, and and three of us, each of us will sign differently. Each of us will sign differently to either approve. Um, or to see whether we should we should uh, 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 remediate you. Okay, so it's very fair. Okay. Now, how do we keep track and we remediate progress? As you know, we see you every six months, and it's usually reviewed by two or three trainers. Uh, previously, we did it online, but nowadays we should be doing it face to face. We look at a logbook, your consolidation sheet, your progress case write up, and your three monthly evaluation, like I told you about. Now, candidates flagged up will be discussed further with the master's coordinator as well as the division for remediation action if necessary. Okay, these are the, actually the index procedures that we expect you to do. Uh, most all of you right now should be in phase three. Uh, these are just numbers uh, which was expected previously, but I'm sure all of you will have uh, uh, gotten all of this already. Things like OGDS, colonoscopy, lab appendix, hernia, all of you shouldn't have any problem. Now, things like PGU and stoma, well, we do not expect you to have at least five in, 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 in uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, um, sorry, these, these, are not, these are not numbers, okay? These are actually the level of competency, sorry. These are level of competency, these are not numbers. So, so you look at it, OGDS, colonoscopy, laparoscopic appendix, you should be doing independently, hernia, PGU repair, stoma, small bowel resection, right hemi colectomy, mastectomy, again, uh, thyroidectomy, all these things should be actually performed independently. Things like left and open colli, you should still be, uh, embolectomy, you should still be uh, performed with some kind of supervision, of course. The profane trauma, you should be doing it alone as well. Um, we have done away with this. I don't think we are, you guys no longer do any head and neck surgery. Uh, here, except, of course, the obvious ones, which is your tracheostomy and also the cervical limb node biopsies. In breast surgery, uh, these are the minimum numbers which uh, which we expect you to do. Um, now, now some uh, now now when you do not achieve these numbers, of course, this is the level and the number which we want you to have. But I think recently there is quite a lot of problems with uh, getting cases, especially the last three years with COVID. I know all of you are stretched, and all of you have been doing COVID work. So, you know, we wouldn't be too harsh on you. Uh, Prepare a lot more, come with those numbers. If you do fall short of those numbers, then we can discuss and see where you fall short and see how we could help you. And, but prepare those not put in advance. I mean, do not come with zero. Like, don't come with zero lumpectomy, zero mastectomy, zero uh, axillary clearance. Like, things if you don't do hook wire localization biopsy, we understand because it's most of the time the fellows do it. Things like micro you don't do, I think it's fine. Okay. So, so, but you know, things like drainage of breast abscess, if you have zero, I think those are things are unacceptable. This is what you're supposed to do in endocrine surgery. Again, I think we are quite flexible on this. Total thyroidectomies, hemithyroidectomies, okay. These are at levels which you're supposed to uh, be um, supervised at. Andrelectomies, we also look at the center, of course, in the center whereby the numbers are not very high. We understand, okay. Um, and that's totally acceptable as well. Thoracic surgery, if you have been in thoracic surgery, you should be doing thoracotomy. If not, I think that's excusable as well. 
Okay, hernias, I think you guys will have to do lah. Uh, maybe not laparoscopic. Laparoscopic, if you look at assisting, at most, maybe you should able to do that. But open hernias, I don't think there's any excuse that you're not doing it. Femoral hernia, they're not very common to come along. But if you have one or two, it's acceptable. If it's zero or so, I wouldn't blame you too much. The incisional hernia, open repair, all these things, you need to have at least one or two numbers, although the preferred minimum number is actually three. Um, and what you see here, uh, colorectal surgery, very important. We need to have some kind of uh, things like uh, reversal can be considered as large bowel anastomosis. Of course, it's under supervision. Right hand colectomy under supervision. Left hand colectomy under supervision as well. Um, uh, uh, right hand colectomy by right is supposed to do it independently, but I think most of you will be supervised. Things are high anterior section. I understand if you don't do it. Uh, I mean, these are also elective procedures. Hartman's procedures. Yeah, I think you need to do this as emergency. Uh, APR and assisting APR, that's also very important. Uh, small bowel anastomosis, primary anastomosis, all this should be independent now. Please, please have some small bowel resection and anastomosis. It's very embarrassing when you come to fourth year and you've never done a small bowel resection. Elastomy, colostomy, hemorrhoidectomy. So this full list could be obtained later. Okay. Again, same thing for upper GI surgery. Okay, I'm just going to rush through this. HPB surgery as well. Okay, they are actually recommended minimum numbers. The vascular surgeries, I also understand there are some things like embolectomy hardly ever comes. I think previously we have discussed that with you candidates who couldn't get those numbers. And, uh, and, and, and usually we will ask uh, Harris's opinion on the condition of this and whether it's uh, suitable for us to put that requirement on you. Uh, urology, not so much, but I think the urology work here is quite, quite, quite a lot. So I think you should be able to, to fulfill it. Um, again, we're not so strict with things like neurosurgery or even PET surgery. PET surgery, most of you should be able to do a simple hernia or endosectomy. Yeah. Okay, emergency procedures are actually very important. Your appendectomy, incision drainage, laparotomy, the primary repair of ulcer, uh, and also a bleeding peptic ulcer. Endoscopy, again, uh, we look at numbers as well. We should have no problems getting all of these numbers. We don't really look at uh, uh, proposcopy and so forth. Okay. Plastic surgery, not really. We don't really look at that, but we should have some numbers. Now, this is what I don't want to look at. Okay, Somebody will come to me, this kind of long book. Uh, uh, look at that laparotomy, right hemi colectomy. This is using the old format. Whereby the, 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 they put the skill level of one, two, three. Year four, he has zero. How am I supposed to let this person go for exams? It's impossible for me to let this person go for exams. Almost everything is zero. They've never done it, and the skill level and done it is just one. How am I supposed to let a surgeon go for exams with this kind of long book? Or like this, right? Okay, would you would you would you trust someone to go for exams and come out as a general surgeon or to do registrar call with this kind of, or a surgeon call with this kind of long book? No, right? So you shouldn't show me this kind of long book. Okay, when 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 you come for 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 clinical evaluation, otherwise we have no choice but to postpone your training, have to extend your training in order for you to fulfill your numbers. Good morning. I mean, good evening, everyone. Okay. I'm going to talk about one of the most important aspects of uh, thesis and research, which is the presentation of your final product. Uh, and this uh, final presentation can actually make or break uh, your actual research. Uh, in fact, if you do a good research project and yet you're not able to present properly, Will, you will probably end up with either with major revisions or even redoing the presentation and things like that. So this presentation is very, very important. It's important that you are able to convey the findings of your research project over the last two, three years in a seven minute presentation to a bunch of academics who are probably not aware of your research or your area of interest which means it has to be clear enough for people who don't know anything about your research to be able to handle it, right? Uh, and, and that's the main uh, uh, idea here, okay? Uh, so before that, we'll very briefly go into the milestone targets. I've shown this to the first years before. I've shown this to all of you, in fact, previously. Uh, let's say you finish your, uh, your, your, your uh, 
uh, whole master's program in four years, you will probably have. Hi, somebody, somebody is not muted. Uh, yeah, someone has to mute themselves. Can you mute yourself? Hello? Wait, I'm trying to find out who it is to mute them. Give me a sec, Triple triple E, triple E, just now have seen the NS. Hi, um, someone is talking. Is it possible to mute yourself? Triple E, triple E, Mister. Okay. All right. I think yeah. Continue, Prof. Okay. Before I continue with this, you all need to learn proper Zoom etiquette, online uh, lectures etiquette. All right. Uh, it's it, you. You're all going to become surgeons. This is uh, all these things are part and parcel of being surgeons. You must learn when you are actually listening to a webinar that you must be muted unless you want to talk. Uh, it's it's uh, just simple stuff, lah. Uh, so that you know you don't irritate the other side because this is how you get into trouble during exams, during presentation because you just don't know how to present it in a way where you don't. Uh, uh, make others feel very irritable. But anyway, never mind. let's move on. Uh, so the milestone targets, okay? Uh, if you actually go through your whole four years uh, uh, and, 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 and uh, complete your course in four years, you would have at least eight sessions of assessment every six monthly. The first session, which begins at the time you register yourself to join the master's program, is when you're all allocated a supervisor and at which point you actually explore your topic or, or area of interest, as well as the research question. And then subsequently, uh, uh, the six monthly uh, assessments, we hope that you already have a proper project proposal ready, at least by the end of year one, by, by mid year one, preferably, if not by end of year one, uh, which would be either the second or third assessments, uh, because you actually need uh, to reasonably uh, think about it, you need a time frame about uh, 18 months to 24 months to actually do the research and a further six months to write it up. So to be very safe for most of you all, especially those who, have, uh, who are just starting, you need to have your project ready, at least a proposal ready by six months into your first year or by the end of the first year. And uh, when we, we talk about uh, the actual, uh, uh, for the final years, by your, uh, uh, beginning of your final year, you must have your pre-final presentation uh, and at least some preliminary results ready uh, with a draft thesis as well. And uh, usually you would be going for your thesis defense three months prior to your final exam. Uh, most of the time is around about January of, uh, of, of that year itself. Of course, there are prerequisites to your thesis presentation. You must always make sure that your thesis presentation has been done in discussion with, as well as have, have approval from your supervisors. That means you must show your supervisors these things and get the approval prior to presenting them. Please don't come to, to us with, oh, I discussed with my supervisor six months ago and they're happy with it, because that's not how you're supposed to present. You, you have to go and show your supervisor and present to them preferably before you come to us. You must bring a soft copy of your thesis uh, this is, I'm talking about the final defense uh, in, in uh, January. Uh, you must have a soft copy of your thesis. Uh, you must have done all the corrections of your previous comments. You must bring in a turnitin report. It is compulsory to bring in a turnitin report. So you must, uh, the, the presentation time given is usually about seven minutes. And uh, usually we would have about 78 minutes for Q&A. And uh, you must remember, uh, especially for the final year uh, presentations, we usually have at least a panel of five senior academics sitting uh, into SS. This actually gives you a reasonably uh, varied opinion as well as I think it's, it's more fairer for you all if you have a bigger pool of people assessing you. Okay, the, the presentation itself. Uh, the presentation itself, uh, as I mentioned, should be a very simple uh, uh, 10 to 14 uh, slide presentation, you have to concentrate mainly on your results and discussion. Because the whole point here is you have had uh, four years uh, or at least three years to actually present to us your proposal, your introduction, your literature review, your sample size, your methodology, all of this has already been assessed. 
we don't want to go through in depth into all of those, especially not the background literature review. That must have already been done already. So we just want you to concentrate primarily. I mean, you touch a little bit about your introduction, uh, methodology, sample size, but concentrate on your results and discussion. So let's talk about the title page itself. The title page should be clear. Your title should be very, very clear. It should have what you want to do, how you want to do it, where you want to do it, as well as when you want to do it. These four uh, points must be there within your uh, title. And I, as a, somebody who has never seen your presentation before, should be able to understand exactly what you're doing because you already told me what, where, when, and how. That, that these four questions must be answered in the title. So go back and check your own titles and make sure you have these four things within your title, okay? Uh, okay, you must obviously have your name and year of study as well as supervisors uh, within the uh, title as well, okay? Uh, I've already mentioned this, seven minutes, 10 to 14 slides. You can have backup slides for additional information if necessary because sometimes we do ask, you can already anticipate the questions we ask, especially about sample size, about literature review, certain relevant papers, uh, additional analyses. These are the kind of things you can put as backup slides, which you can bring up when you're asked a relevant question. It shows that you're well prepared and uh, uh, you know you, you already are ready for the, the, the defense itself, okay? Uh, make sure your, your presentation itself is in, in simple sentences only the relevant information is included and it must be relevant to your level of training and year of study. The introduction itself, uh, basically you must have a good background which includes what the problem is, what is already known about the problem, what do you think is unknown and what, how do you want to achieve this? These are the four questions you must answer in the introduction slide. So the problem itself is simple. Let's take the title I showed you, laparoscopic herniography. So the problem is, is laparoscopic herniography cost-effective or safe or, or, or has better pain control? Something like that. That's a problem. You must then tell us what is already known about this. Laparoscopic herniography has uh, uh, less pain compared to open herniography. So because of that, we think the quality of life is better. Uh, what is unknown? The quality of life itself is unknown. Uh, and how do you want to achieve this? Prospectively, you want to assess the quality of life of patients who undergo laparoscopic herniography. This is how you actually explain your introduction in one or two slides. Then we move on to the literature review. Literature review, at this point, you've already gone through in depth in your second and third year, hopefully. Okay. So by the time you come to this, we just want a short summary of the most relevant literature. The best way to present the summary is in a table form, where you present the author, the short title, the design of the paper itself, and maybe one or two data points. So what are the important data points you have found from that paper, as well as your comment. You, put, you don't have to put every literature you have searched, but all the important literature, especially the ones you're getting a sample size from, must be included here. And then we move on to the research question. The research question is, quite simple. What is the main problem you want to investigate? And you must write down the problem as a simple question, okay? For example, here, is laparoscopic herniography better than open herniography? So that's our research question. Of course, then the question comes, what do you mean by better? Is better really a good word? Uh, do we have any uh, other more clearer terms to use? So you can use terms like, is laparoscopic herniography uh, better than open hernia, uh, uh, is the surgical outcomes of laparoscopic herniography better than open herniography? Or is laparoscopic herniography more cost effective than open herniography? Or does laparoscopic herniography confer better quality of life than open herniography? So that becomes a better question because now you're clarifying what your question is. Moving on to the research objectives. When you talk about research objectives, you have to have only one primary objective and maybe two or maximum three uh, secondary objectives. You cannot have more than that. A research objective must always reflect your research question. And it must always say, it must always start with the word to. That means it's a verb. It's a, 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 an active thing you're doing. 
you want to evaluate, you want to quantify, you want to assess, you want to compare. So like in the previous example, I would say my research objective is uh, to uh, assess or to compare the quality of life in patients undergoing laparoscopic herniography versus open herniography. That's your primary objective. So that's, that's how you do it, to compare the quality of life. Let's move on to the method. So when you're talking about methodology, the study design must be explained. What was it? Was it a prospective, retrospective, uh, randomized? Uh, uh, what kind of study design is it? Okay. You, then you move on to ethics approval, especially when you're coming to final year thesis presentation. Ethics approval is compulsory. And you must make sure that your, 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 your even for retrospective studies, you must have an ethics approval. You cannot do any research without ethics approval. Okay. You must briefly mention to us what was the sampling technique and the sample size itself, <clears throat> as well as a description of the measures or outcomes. So what was the uh, measure? Uh, description of outcomes is usually a demographic uh, table. So you must tell us what, how you measured this uh, demographic table, the number of people, the number of uh, uh, EMR records you saw, etc. You must tell us what instruments was used to measure the outcomes. Uh, and this includes, let's say, the outcome of quality of life. So what kind of uh, uh, questionnaire did you use? Or what kind of, uh, uh, in, in genetic tests, what kind of an assay did you use? And things like that. So the instruments must be clearly uh, explained. And you must also tell us the procedures used to collect the data. Did you actually do a questionnaire-based uh, assessment? Did you do a, a direct uh, uh, interview? Did you actually go to the field and collect data from patients based on blood analysis? What was the actual procedures you used to collect? Uh, you must mention what statistical methods you used to analyze the data. And finally, you must tell us what was the uh, fund or grant or budget that was used for this paper, uh, for this research, if there was any. Most of the stuff I told you, everything from study design to the measures to the outcome to the patient, uh, everything, including inclu inclusion, exclusion criteria, all of this can be put up in a uh, consort diagram. A consort diagram is something like this, where you actually have got the number of patients who are enrolled, the number of patients who were excluded, and why they were excluded. And then you tell what was the randomization or what was the differentiation. Uh, and at any point, the patient drops out, then you draw an arrow and tell us the patient dropped out here because I could not follow up. The patient dropped out here because there was complication in surgery. And finally, this was the number of patients I analyzed. This is a very, very easy way for uh, most of us to understand what you're doing. Okay, so always include a proper consort diagram, which includes your exclusion inclusion criteria. By doing this, you as, you you don't have to put a slide up on you know, what the inclusion was, what the exclusion was, and how did you randomize who, how many patients were in each arm. All of them are in here already. All right, so try to keep. Uh, a good, uh, try to create a good uh, consort diagram for your own uh, presentation. Sample size calculation. This is something that trips you up very frequently in your second and third year, somewhere in the middle, okay? Sample size calculation, uh, Gauri has already organized a workshop previously. I hope all, most of you all have attended. Uh, the main thing you need to know is the sample size is dependent on your either your mean difference or standard deviation, which is derived from previous uh, studies previous similar studies. And this is then used within the calculator to uh, with the standard power of 0 0.8, uh, type one error 0 0.05, drop power rate 20%. These last three numbers are almost always standardized, right? And then all these numbers are plugged in into any of these various uh, sample size calculators and you get your number of sample size. Make sure you get the correct mean difference. And if you have multiple mean differences, uh, because you've got three or four objectives, you must take the largest one, not the smallest mean difference, all right? Uh, 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 you must take the largest sample size, sorry, which means the smallest mean difference. The smaller the mean difference, the larger the sample size, okay? Again, this is your final defense. We don't want to go in detail into this, but we expect you to be able to defend yourself when we ask you about your sample size calculation. Gun chart. This is not so much applicable for the final year defense. I don't think you need this in your final year paper because you've already reached the end. But this is much more important for the people who are actually having their uh, biannual assessment to tell us where exactly you're stuck at and are you progressing well enough. 
So for those who are in your year two, year three, when they come for presentation, this is compulsory. We need to see where you are. But for final year defense, I don't think we need this. Okay, let's move on to the results section. So when you talk about results, like I said just now, in the final year defense, the most important bit is your results and discussion. So I want to see more stuff about your results. I, I probably would want to see your research question, your objective, and then I want to see your methodology and straight I want to go into your results because that's the most important thing I want to see. And uh, in your results segment, I want to see demographics and clinical characteristics, preferably in a table form where you highlight the most relevant points. And then every objective must have a result. So that's why I said, don't try, uh, try not to put more than two or three objectives because every objective must have a specific result. Let's say you want to look at the quality of life, that quality of life must be there. You want to look at surgical outcome, surgical outcome must be there. Cost effectiveness, all the various cost effectiveness must be there. And when you have the uh, results, you must then put them up either in a, in a table form, especially if it's a T-student, chi-square, ANOVA, regression, or even uh, 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 univariate, multivariate analysis, etc. If you have got an AUC or a uh, kaplan meier survival curves, then you put them up as curves. Don't try to duplicate the data. What you've already put up in a uh, table form, don't put them up in uh, curves. And similarly, uh, try not to put up very uh, juvenile presentations of pie charts and histograms. Uh, we are all surgeons and we have written multiple papers and things like that. So we do want to see uh, things where you actually are regressing into a very, very simplified form of presentation. Pie charts and all don't really convey enough information for us in a scientific manner. So we, we want to see something a bit more than that. This is an, a good example of a demographic uh, clinical characteristic. So on the uh, left-hand side, we put all the clinical characteristics. Then you've got the columns for the uh, actual uh, numbers. And finally, you've got a p-value. And out of this, you can just highlight the ones which are important. But sometimes you also want to highlight the ones which are not important, which are not significant, but important. So you don't just highlight only significant results. Okay, even if you don't have a significant result, sometimes you might want to say, oh, there were certain types of indication for surgery, which was very interesting and which actually makes a difference. So you, you want to bring out the most pertinent point of your study, and that may not necessarily be just the significant results. Okay. What about the discussion and conclusion? Okay, so you, you want to restate your original problem so everybody understands what you were actually what it was you were looking for don't just straight jump into your uh, oh uh, my results say such and such you must come back and say look i wanted to look at the quality of life in laparoscopy versus uh, open versus uh, and uh, laparoscopic uh, surgery and in my study this is what i found so you summarize your conclusions and then you describe the support for your study's conclusion in comparing with existing literature. This is where you have to bring in your literature and show what your current, the current literature shows versus yours. It can be different, it can be the same, it doesn't matter, okay? You must describe the study's generalizability to our population. You must describe the study's limitation. Don't wait for your uh, lecturers to ask you about limitation because they are going to ask you about limitations, okay? You, it's better for you to already explain that. You can accept or reject the null hypothesis if you have any. You must describe new research questions generated by your study results. And finally, you must make final recommendation based upon study's result. Uh, you know, do you accept it? Would you practice it? Would you advocate uh, changes of practice uh, because of your study, things like that. That's what makes a, the, the presentation much more interesting. Remember, you don't always have to have significant result uh, for the study to matter. Even if a study doesn't have significant result, that still matters because that tells us that this, uh, the, the current existing, your, your, your research question uh, is actually false and you don't, you don't want to go down that road which you have actually uh, proposed to research on. There's nothing wrong with that. We want to find out what is right and what is not right. We, uh, and, and, and just because you got a non-significant result doesn't mean you're wrong. It just means that that research itself uh, is not worth pursuing after that. That's all it means, okay? Again, I want to as, emphasize the milestones, okay? So that's the end of my presentation itself, uh, the, the slide deck. And this, this slide deck is something you can use uh, to guide you you to actually uh, present it 
in a simple, summarized, succinct way so you get across the information you want to get without uh, confusing your lecturers, okay? Uh, oh, yes. You can add on an acknowledgement slide if you want to. Uh, in fact, it would be nice if you actually include an acknowledgement slide uh, because you will have had help from your supervisors, your co-investigators, advisors, statisticians, uh, surgical research unit, people like uh, Gauri and Tanya and Jasmine, uh, especially if they are not your official supervisor, it'll be good to actually acknowledge them. And finally, Turnitin is compulsory. You must have less than 20% uh, similarity index. Please do avoid plagiarism. Plagiarism is an automatic fail. So please uh, make sure by the time you come to us, your Turnitin uh, assessment says less than 20%. If it's more than 20%, don't even bother coming to us. Okay. I can't emphasize this enough. At the end of the day, when we ask you questions in your uh, thesis defense, we, it's not because we are, uh, we are so dumb or we don't understand it or, or, or anything. It's sometimes we want to see whether you're able to defend your own findings. Okay. So the whole idea here is that's why it's called a thesis defense. You must defend the way why you did the study the way you conducted the study, your own results, and what the results mean. And you must be able to explain it in your own words. That's what defending your findings mean. And that's what we are asking for. If you're able to defend, even if the results don't make sense, or you didn't have enough sample size, or you, you, you could only uh, conduct half a study, as long as you can defend those findings well enough, I'm willing to accept it. Uh, I think uh, Gauri will talk a little bit more about the assessment criteria and what we are looking for, especially in the final defense. I will mention a little bit though about the decisions. There are only four types of decision. Either the uh, presentation was accepted or there is a minor revision, which is usually done by you and uh, supervised by your supervisor. There may be major revision, in which case you have to come back and present to us again, uh, usually anywhere from four to six weeks down the road, or it could be rejected. If it is rejected, it is a failed thesis and you are extended for six months. So these are the only four type of results you can get in your thesis defense. So again, before I finish this, this talk itself, I wanna emphasize that the thesis defense is for you to show us how much of work you've done in your research and how much do you understand about the actual process of research, which includes everything from designing a, 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 a research project to implementing the research project, uh, to finding out what are the limitations and the problems of a research project, uh, to identifying biases and trying to overcome them, to actually do the data collection and data analysis, and then to present them in a clear way to communicate the actual findings of that research uh, project, okay? Whether it's significant or not does not matter. You can have a non-significant result. You can have less than sample size as long as you communicate to us clearly what was done and what it means, that is more than enough uh, for you to pass your exam, uh, for you to pass your thesis at least, yeah? Uh, so that's the end of my talk. Is there any questions? I need to go to theater, so I probably won't be here for the Q&A. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So all of you just uh, listen from Prof. Vitamin that you need to submit your Tanitin report at the end of your thesis. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about the plagiarism and also the application of tarnitin, like how you are going to use the tarnitin for your for checking the plagiarism. Uh, this is a picture I have put it here. Can any one of you tell that I have uh, deep plagiarize it or I just steal it something like that? Plagiarism means taking someone else's work. So I have done it or not? Not done it. Why? Because you took somebody else's work and didn't work for it. So not done it or I did it, according to your answer. Actually, what she's asking is, has she plagiarized or not plagiarized? Or not plagiarized. On this slide, has Tanya plagiarized this or she has not plagiarized? Oh, yes. That's what she's, yeah. 
I think no because she wrote there the um the link to the picture right she stated where she got her picture yes thank you for that sir so you got uh, my point like uh, plagiarism means actually taking someone else work without acknowledging them or even acknowledging them but without proper citation or you don't you haven't mentioned anything like that for this one i have copied from the internet but as i acknowledge the website and also that from somewhere i have taken it's not my own picture or my own slide so it's not plagiarism okay uh, actually there is a idea among the student like uh, plagiarism means only copying someone else text or work but not only text any graph anything you taken from some someone else manuscript or work or anything or any website you should mention that okay so uh, what is plagiarism plagiarism i just mentioned uh, now that it's uh, if you are presenting someone else work or ideas as your own with or without their consent okay maybe your friend or your colleague already give you permission so you have incorporated their work in your work but without full acknowledgement then it is called plagiarism he or she has given consent but still you need to acknowledge okay then it's not plagiarism plagiarism is actually uh, since 1999 in the um it's a uh, they can take action if you plagiarize okay and currently there are lots of tricks i know all of you know from your senior or you already know that you can play, uh, you can even plagiarize but uh, without tarnitin showing it you can do that like doing some of the trick you can show like okay tarnitin cannot find the uh, the plagiarism or can reduce the plagiarism but please don't do that because after certain time if someone copy your work and put in the tarnitin again you might be caught okay so uh, this is your lifetime work so don't do that okay so uh, what does plagiarism actually look like uh, is actually copying someone work not only someone work citing a source improperly because sometimes uh, like we take some of the information and then cite only one or two or maybe one but uh, actually many people has done this the main work then you need to cite properly like uh, acknowledge them as well but it's quite difficult sometimes and then failure to cite a source you haven't cited properly okay so another one is creating a false source like uh, you don't have time or anything you just put the references you put before so you just put the same reference afterwards so that's also part of plagiarism okay and then turning in another person work as your own that's already all of you know i think uh, also so as i mentioned like uh, university malaya has rules and they actually strongly recommend for graduate uh, students this was uh, this book actually contain all the thing that you need to follow for uh, ever the plagiarism okay and already prof vairavan has shared with you your similarity index shouldn't be uh, more than 20 for this one zero gone somewhere uh, sorry for that. so it is more than given okay and write up your how to avoid this plagiarism so to avoid this plagiarism uh, it's like a preventive measure for you to take okay uh, to prevent this plagiarism you can actually follow four things first one is first thing you need to know about plagiarism just now i mentioned a little bit but you need to know more what is plagiarism then only you can avoid that right and then the second thing you do while writing you must use your own words okay uh, even if you are writing some other manuscript work or you have taken from somewhere where 
you just try to use your own words to describe and then just cite it, okay? And then represent your own ideas. Like uh, you are mentioning many of the studies, many of the uh, information there, but uh, try to put your, in your own ideas what they did and what you are supposed to do. So then it, it will avoid to the plagiarism part, okay? And then the, one of the most important thing is using proper citation, which mostly student doesn't do, okay? So these are the steps you can avoid plagiarism, like uh, when you are writing your thesis, okay? So uh, for avoiding plagiarism or similarities also, uh, UM actually uh, use the Turnitin software. There are many software, but we use Turnitin to check and Turnitin has uh, not for originality check, it's a software which also used for grade and peer mark, but we don't use here. So uh, when you, you use the Turnitin, you need to remember this is a software which actually filter your work with the other sources. There are many, uh, there is a very big repository of the Turnitin for most of the internet sources, journal article, and also the student report and other report. That's why actually even not unpublished thing also sometimes Turnitin gets, okay. So uh, how you are going to check your thesis or dissertation or manuscript you are going to submit using the Turnitin. First thing you need to do is to create a Turnitin account, then submit your thesis and manuscript, and then the, you can check the review of the originality report, okay? This is the website you can use. So uh, I'm showing you the installation guide. Actually, this is the UM library one. You can get all the information, which I will show a little bit later uh, from this, uh, this web page from the UM library, you can see how you can download the Turnitin and you can, how you can use, everything is there. So this is how the, you can create your own account in the Turnitin. And actually, uh, once you create your own account, you can submit, okay, as an instructor or as a student. So uh, what happened in UM, actually in the library, you can, uh, once uh, you ask the library, they will give you the, the access and then only you can submit your thesis, okay? This is how the Turnitin normally look like for the student or even the, if you are instructor, same thing. You can create an account and you can submit your assignment and then you can submit in the button like here. And then this window will pop up, then you need to, fill up this part and then you need to click this button either from the Dropbox or Google Drive or from your computer laptop, you will find out your thesis or report and then we'll click it. Then once you click it, Turnitin will ask you to confirm, is it the right document or not? So you can go page one to the all the pages and confirm that, okay, this is your thesis you are going to check. Okay, so once you do it, so you can you can see like this. Okay, so there are different uh, in the window. There are different options. You need to click the originality, and you can see here like twenty three percent is matching the similarity, and when it match, actually the Turnitin shows the different color with the different reference number, like the red color, the the purple color and then the dark pink color, those all the colors shows and it also mentioned which reference, like from where it seems like uh, you have taken the wording or you have taken the text. So you can check from this part actually, and then you can rephrase or you can do it. So this is how it looks. Another paper I just put for your own purpose, like once I did the Turnitin check, so it shows 31% is similarity. So as you, as I mentioned, it should be less than 20%. So uh, you can check which one is 
similar and then you can do it okay so there are a few things uh, you can need to know like as i have shown you like 31 percent match then i need to know how before submitting the report how i can reduce it to 20 percent below 20 percent so uh, there are a few things you need to keep in your mind to reduce the plagiarism one is identification, one is summarize, one is citation, quotation, and paraphrasing. So for the identification purpose, uh, you can keep in mind, normally this type of software, they identify like this one, the third one, this internet source they have taken from this paper, okay? Or from the internet information. Normally they identify if, six or more word is there. So suppose this is the another uh, another sentence showing that similarities. So what you can do, this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So what you can do, you can actually break the sequence, okay? You can rephrase it. So once you identify what are the sources, you can rephrase it, okay? And then or uh, paraphrase it, or you can put the proper citation if citation is not okay. This is one thing. Uh, another thing I just mentioned the summarized thing. Remember that you must put the original sources references. And when you summarize, it should be shorter than the talk, than the text you have summarized, okay? It's not like the same you have taken from someone's work, okay? Uh, and then you must use your own words, okay? With, you cannot use the quotation this purpose when you summarize. Then another uh, thing to reduce the plagiarism, I just mentioned like, you must put the references of the original sources. Uh, sometimes if you see, uh, there might be references, but might be wrong thing. Okay, here I can put a reference. Even sometimes one or two putting references, you can see still it's not working. Okay, maybe same type of thing like done by few other studies, so Tarnitin is taking it. So one option is putting citation, proper citation, and another option, the paper is like the 17 number, you need, can scroll down, you can check, and then you can cite it. Another option is sometimes we do the quotation marks. Quotation marks, double quotation, if I put, then Tarnitin will not uh, take it as a similarity. You are acknowledging the, their work that uh, you have taken from their paper or manuscript or that website. But remember when you do the quotation things, you need to take exactly from their work, not in your own writing. You cannot quote it, okay? Uh, there is another thing for the quotation one also, that when you do the quotation mark, also you need to put the citation, okay? And the length of the original text quoted should be the same length you have taken taken from someone else's work, okay? And then uh, you must include the page number of the sources and other things if it's you have taken from the original work. But one thing remember, the quotation mark, uh, like we can put many, we cannot put many quotation marks in the thesis or other, uh, more than 25% <coughs> cannot put quotation marks. Then <clears throat> it will look like uh, you have taken you didn't did your own thesis, you have taken more from other people's work, okay? Uh, then the last important thing is the paraphrasing, okay? Paraphrasing is you must use your own words. You are describing some one thing, but you must use your own words to describe it, okay? And the text you produce may be shorter or longer than the original text, but you must put the reference of the original sources. I have mentioned so many times the putting the original references means citation, proper citation. 
because even if you put the paraf do the paraphrasing quotation or other things it will be unethical if you don't acknowledge their work okay that's why the proper citation is very important in all the aspect so these are the websites you can actually check okay so uh, this is one of the website i just mentioned the um library one can you see the this one library yeah i can see it so okay I'm sure they can see it too uh, so this is actually um library just i just mentioned now so you can see they have turned it in everything what is turn it in so you can see then how to create a Tarnitin account. You can create your own Tarnitin account and you can ask them. They have done given step by step. Okay, that's why I didn't go in details. And then how to use Tarnitin. They have the videos, any, everything they already have here. Okay, so uh, what to do and what not to do. Then the videos is, are there. So you can see the videos from the library which is because you can find many in the YouTube, but libraries one is authentic. So it's better to see those, okay? And then if you have any question or anything, you can ask them or you can find your answer even here, okay? Uh, how you can do, everything is there. So from the library side, you can ask and you do your own turn it in one. Now I will show you how to uh, do that one. So. I just mentioned the Turnitin uh, website you can use. You can log in. Okay, so uh, this is the assignment part. So I just want to show you one. Okay, this is the, suppose this is my assignment one. I want to submit one new, just to show you all. So uh, this. Okay, then uh, I will choose my file from the computer. If I'm too fast or you cannot follow, just let me know, okay. So this file, I, I already checked. This is one of the paper actually published already. Still, I'm showing you. Uh, so I have uh, clicked the uploading button. So it's uploaded. And then once uploaded, actually Turnitin is asking me to confirm because I can take the wrong file as well. So what you can do, you can check, okay. Is it the correct one or not? So uh, I found, okay, it's, this is the file I need to check. So I confirm it. Okay, so uh, go to the assignment inbox. Okay, so my similarities. It takes some time. Few seconds. Sometimes it can take up to an hour, but if it's three pages, I think it should come up within the. Normally, within a minute yeah. also, it uh, comes. It can, yeah. Uh, maybe I can show the some others already there. Okay, because you already seen that how to. Uh... Oh, this one submitted one. As I mentioned, like uh, I have taken one of the published paper. Actually, that's why it's showing 100%. Okay, so this is the paper. Okay, so it's showing 100%. I have plagiarized. You can click this button, okay, and can see the submitted student paper, okay. MDPI, this is the journal we have put, so it's 98%. So 
submitted paper because I already uh, put one here before. That's why it's showing that I didn't use the same place to submit. That's why this is another thing you need to remember when you submit uh, from one account, you must resubmit the paper on that account on that resubmission. Then it won't show because this is this submitted to the university student paper. This is my own one. Okay. But this is the paper uh, you can see this paper one. Okay. Diagnostic and artificial intelligence enable pipeline. This, this is our paper actually. Okay. So this is how you can actually see your own uh, similarities thing. And then actually this one, 100% this color and this, that's why they didn't show. Otherwise, actually it shows uh, with the different color. Suppose this one, different color here, the other different color you can see, okay. Once you do it, finish it. You can download it actually, okay. And then uh, you can do it. Then uh, at the bottom, you will see my one doesn't show you, sorry. Uh, at the bottom of that, some problem. Actually at the bottom, there will be a, a print option and then you can actually download the PDF file and then you can submit the report, okay. I think that's all from my point. Yeah, um, Tanik, maybe you can just quickly show um, because of what you meant that you resubmit within the same, if you, they create an assignment, they have to resubmit uh, in the same to bring the percentage down. Can you just show, do you have one which is like that so they, they understand that? Uh, that? Because right now you submitted a, a new report file that's why it's 100% similar. Now yeah. say they submit something and it's similar, more than 20% similar, and they need to bring it down. But if they sum it somewhere else, then they cannot bring it, it will still show it's copied because they've uploaded their thesis, right? So do you have an example where you mean by adding in the same place? Oh, I'm trying to see that, okay. Actually not working. It's become very slow. Actually, once you submitted it, uh, there is the option like you can resubmit it in the button. Uh, you you normally set it up in the beginning itself, right? So like how you did yeah. the test, right? Yeah. You would say allow more than... Uh, one submission or something like that. I don't know. It's... Normally you can see, find it here, the once you open uh, resubmission. Try um, more uh, actions. What does it say? You can I, yeah, so it's, I think that's something which needs to be, uh, we need to be up here. Okay. So you I... have this, it ends, you set the date as, yeah, any one of this. Okay. This is okay, how, yeah, here. okay. I, similarities one. Okay. Like uh, once I reduce, I can resubmit it. Okay. So so basically what happens is, you know how she created this now, a retest. So if you see on her top, she, she has a title called COVID-19B. So within the same um, overall file name, so in her retest, that's not 100%. So she goes there and she tries to reword the whole thing in her own, in a, in a totally different way. 
she can resubmit within the retest another document. So just like here, there's two documents where initially she had the one which was 35% similar called COVID-19 BD. Then she had tried to reduce percentage. She re-uploads yeah. within the same uh, assignment and yeah. she brought it down to 25 and she retested at 25. Maybe she now needs yeah. to bring it down to 20%. So she'll re-edit within that. If you do that, it will not say it's similar from somewhere else because yeah. they know that you are testing it within within your own file. So this is and, a way for you all to test. Yeah. There's also external Turnitin softwares, uh, I mean, Turnitin uh, Spillageroom softwares where you can test if you don't want to use this first because you, you think it's more what tedious. I mentioned, but it's best to use this. Yeah, why I mentioned this because you in someone and other people account you have done, then you do your own, then it will be a problematic, more problematic. You try to use yeah. your own account and even you can ask help from the library also. They can delete if if it's needed. Okay. I think that's all. Yeah, uh, thank you. These are you, the acknowledgement. Okay. Because I don't want to be <laughs> plagiarized. <laughs> okay. So these are the website and the people I want to acknowledge. And they are, here I have added some of the paraphrasing tool. Actually, sometimes it is useful. Like you don't, uh, you can use these tools to paraphrase your work. So you can reduce the similarities, okay? Even Grammarly has the paraphrasing tool. You don't have uh, that much time or you don't have that much thing. So you try to do your own or you can use the tools as well. Okay, that's all. This is the guidelines which has been set in 2017 and there's a supplementary document for Department of Surgery because there is a bit of a variation from for your program from what is set at the postgraduate uh, faculty level. I will circulate those documents or it should have been circulated before. So overall, there's actually three different formats which are available for your program, which is the conventional format, which has a template, uh, a set template. You can also choose, uh, discuss with your supervisors whether you should want to do your thesis as an article format, or if you've actually published your work before your defense, you might want to choose the uh, format of a published paper format. So these uh, details of these guidelines are in these pages within that booklet, which we have shown you. Uh, but I, I do notice that most people end up using the, between the conventional and article style format, which is all acceptable. There are word, uh, limitation uh, variations between the different formats. Obviously, the conventional format ends up uh, having a bit of a higher minimum word count. But having said that, that is because it probably has a bit more content in terms of methodology because in the article format, you're planning or hoping at the end, you might take that chapter to publish it. And so the word limit is a bit less. But I know a lot of you worry that the minute the word limit, uh, minimum word limit is more, that you won't be able to write as much. Actually, the word limit is that you will easily make uh, be able to meet the minimum requirements as stated here if, if everything is written well. So it is more of covering the important points in your thesis rather than the word limit. If you notice at the end, you will actually easily re reach these word limits. Now, for all the three formats, the beginning, the and the ends uh, do look like this. You need your title page. You need to declare that the work which you're submitting is original, hence the whole emphasis on using the Turnitin software. For your program, you do not require, so in terms of the faculty level for the, the other theses, uh, they do require to have both uh, Malay and English abstract, but for yours, you do not need a uh, Malay Bahasa Malaysia abstract, you just need an English abstract. You will then have your acknowledgements, uh, table of contents, you will list the your figures, list of tables, symbols and abbreviations used in your throughout your thesis, as well as the list of supplementary documents. So in under your supplementary documents, if you have published something, you can put your list of publications. Uh, if you have presented your work at conferences, you can list where you have presented your work so far any awards you have uh, received related to the thesis or otherwise. 
you can or during uh, otherwise meaning during your program any other awards you will also then list any like if you have handouts or if a thesis had handouts uh your maybe also your consent form your ethics approval forms all of those things can go at the under the supplementary part at the back of your thesis if so happen you have published your work during and it's accepted somewhere and it's, and it's published when you have come to your defense which is following the third format you will need to then attach uh, consent from the other co-authors of the published work at in the at the back of your thesis. Okay, so coming to the individual main bodies, so the conventional format which most of you are uh, using, you will have this an introduction. So I will get into what is the uh, what is needed in your introduction in chapter one, followed by literature review, which will end up being like a guide, a mini guidebook of the topic which you're studying, a topic area which you're studying. And then you need your methods, how you're conducting your study, your results, your discussion, your and your conclusion. And obviously you need references at the end. I will touch on what exactly we mean by our reference list later. Okay. While in the article format, you'll actually end up having two different uh, introductions because the article is, as I said, it's a preset of how you would want to submit your your paper to a specific journal or something like that. You might not have an idea which journal, but you'll set it up like a manuscript. And that actually is your chapter three, which is different from your conventional format, as I showed earlier. But keep in mind, in the general introduction, uh, which will be the same as any of the uh, of the other introduction. You need to cover your rationale. You will state your clearly in subsections your research question, your research objectives, your research hypothesis, as well as how you plan to uh, general um, execution of what is to uh, the other chapters which are to come in after your chapter one. In your literature review, what I would like to highlight is, as I said, it's a mini guide. So you need to have subsections of background. So say if you're dealing with a disease like breast cancer, you might want to end up having some sort of pathophysiology, epidemiology, and so forth. All of those kind of information, which are not uh, directly related to your research question or your rationale of your thesis, you'll put, put all of those information in literature review. This is where most of the time where you might end up uh, over uh, play, over copying text which is already available so rephrasing it in your own words in the literature review is quite important then comes your uh, article where you have your which is written up your introduction which is how it would you see in published papers it's about three paragraphs saying what exactly the paper is going to be about ending with the objective of the paper and your methods as well it will be in in details of um, the study population study design and uh, study outcomes and so forth. And I've already touched on what your results should be. Now, conclusion, this is the same for all, all the three formats. You need to conclude your findings. Also state what is the limitations and the future directions. And this can be, it's actually also can be part of your discussion. So your conclusion may be a chapter in this section, but it is actually a subsection on its own. Now, published paper format, I'm not going to go again uh, describing each of it, but the difference here is that it's already published. So you kind of just put the published paper into, into your chapters. We still need to have your introduction. We still need to have your literature review. Methods, uh, maybe obviously it's a published paper. It's a summarized version of your methods. So maybe the expand methods where has not been in uh, detailed in the published paper, you might want to put in detailed methods in your chapter three. And then again, you'll discuss uh, what has not been already discussed in the paper and you will conclude. Now coming to the cover page and binding. Okay, so I'm just gonna click through it. So this is already preset. If you use the template, they've already come up with these measurements, but say if you're not using a template or if you're using the template and it has moved, just check that uh, the cover page is following these uh, requirements. This is set by the university. So it is, they are quite strict um, in regards to this. Hence, we highlight that you follow what they suggest in terms of fonts, in terms of spacing and, and so forth. So I'm not gonna go step by step 
in in terms of all of this you can look at the guidelines when you come for your actual uh cd you're not going to come with this red book this is when you actually successfully have defended and you uh you have you are going to give in about about one month i think to correct whatever is needed and then you'll be asked to print this uh print it in the terms of the hard copy and for that it is very important that you follow this format and the the reason it is important that you notice that sorry i'm getting a new drink to water okay so in this case when you actually come for your defense you're not giving this red book you're actually giving us a loosely bound copy of the pages you can just put a simple uh, clip on and but however at the end after defending and you actually need to submit it to the office before going to exams it needs to be this format and you also have to submit a soft copy of your cd with your name matrix number thesis title which faculty and which year and this will be submitted to sharifa after your supervisors have signed the forms and so forth now remember i mentioned about referencing so for your master of surgery um, thesis the format requirement even though at faculty level they say off the date style, but actually for your program, it is numbered style and numbered following the Vancouver style, like the IJU, which is the International Journal of Urology. So even though we say Vancouver style, the Vancouver style, the original Vancouver style is not a square superscript bracket. It's numbered style, but it's actually a circle, a normal bracket and it's not superscript. So that's why I'm saying like IJU. And this is how it should look within the text, within your thesis document. And at the back, since it's numbered style, it should go according to what it uh, it should look something like this. We're not so particular in terms of whether you name all the authors and so forth, as long as it's standardized. That means you shouldn't have between, this is why we suggest that you use uh, something like EndNote, so you don't have to do the tedious work of checking. It should do it for you. You just have a quick check that it's it's done it nice, it's done it correctly. That's all. The other thing which Tanya already brought up, but I'm just bringing it up again. The whole plagiarism. The reason why we say this, it's actually in your guidebooks, in the um, postgraduate guidebooks, that it, you shouldn't plagiarize. Uh, she's already covered why and so forth. Other um, highlights which I'd like to bring is the quality of this is of the paper. It should be single sided, not double sided. And in terms of font, uh, besides the front page, which is supposed to be Times Roman fourteen and sixteen and so forth, which I showed you earlier, the cover page, in within the document it should be twelve. Uh, maybe the tables and figures maybe can be less if it needs to fit within a page. We said obviously you use Microsoft version six. Uh, version six or more it should be double based and justified if you use a template these things sh should be already there the key thing about the margin is you do not want everything should be two except for your left margin should be four because if it's going to be the hard bounded copy you don't want your words eating into the into the cover in into the binding and that's why they have set it at four your subsections within chapter one it should start 1.1 1 .1, 1 1.2 and so forth and obviously if it's chapter two then it should start from 2.1 the same thing applies to your tables and figures within each chapter the table should start with table 2.1 uh, if it's chapter three starting 3.1 and the same thing with the figures if you have footnotes it should look something like this even if you're using it it's not compulsory but if you're going to use a footnote you should uh, follow this now, this is what uh, Prof. Wyron brought it up a little bit in his talk, and he said, I will be covering it. Yes. So he's already brought up about how the verdict is given for your CD um, defense. But these are the subsections. This is exactly how what we are given to basically tick in terms of whether your title makes sense. He already covered what, how to make, your make sure your title actually covers all of these things. It is also important. We also look at how you introduce, how you state and clarify your whether your problem is um, clear and whether your pro problem is relevant. We see whether your literature review is adequate and relevant to the problem you're trying to answer in your presentation, that is, as well as within your thesis document. We will also look at your the methods which you use. It is all right if your method is going to be a retrospective design. 
but we will see that it is appropriate and it's that your question, which is uh, which you're using, the way you went about it is correct. We obviously, the focus at your defense is your results and how you discuss it. So we'll see how you are presenting it, how you interpret your results, whether you're making sense, whether you understand what your results mean. It's all right if it's not significant. If you know it's not significant and you just be honest and state exactly what you found and discuss why it ended up that way. And, and this is exactly how we end up deciding at the end whether you defend it well or not. Okay, keep in mind, the, we also know that it's not plagiarized, so we do ask for your Turnitin analysis. You, we do look at your slide design and presentation. Don't come with your presentation slides with, with just copy-paste text and try and make effort on how, this, how you present uh, design your slides and how you present your slides, your tone and so forth. And of course, you are giving us one copy of your soft copy thesis. So we do look at your thesis format and see whether it's adequate. And if it's not, we will end up taking it's unsatisfactory and we'll highlight it to you. So that's pretty much it.